The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending this morning's webinar. The Mega Rule Part 1 deadline is here. Are you ready? My name is Marissa Davis. I'm Marketing Manager here at G2, and I'll be facilitating this uh, morning's presentation. The host of today's webinar, G2 Integrated Solutions, provides responsive support in a comprehensive suite of asset integrity, engineering, GIS, field services, regulatory compliance, and technology solutions that address asset performance through its life cycle. If you want to know more about us, go ahead and visit our website at g2-is.com. All right, now I'll introduce you to our presenters today. First, we have Al Giordano. Al leads our regulatory compliance team here at G2. He's a licensed professional engineer with several years of experience in the energy industry and a focus on DOT regulatory compliance, regulatory audits, product management, and integrity management. Al has also served as a FEMSA inspector as well as a Marine Compliance Inspector for the United States Marine Coast Guard. I'm sorry, the United States Coast Guard. Next, we have Terry Strahan. Terry manages our GIS team here at G2 and has over 30 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. His role centers around advanced technical geospatial consulting to the pipeline industry, um, engineering, regulatory compliance, and field services. Um, he's currently a member of both the National Board of Directors for GIDA and the National Board of Directors for GISCI. Finally, we have Tracy Thorlefson. Tracy leads our software development team here and has an extensive background in petroleum and pipeline industry data, business process, and physical process modeling. He is a founding member of the Pipeline Open Data Standard Organization and has served pods in various roles. He also currently serves as a lecturer at the University of Houston's Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, or sciences where he teaches the course Advanced GIS for Geologists. Um, we have a lot to cover this morning, so we'll save questions for the end of the webinar. At any point during the presentation, if you have any questions, if you'll just go ahead and submit them through the question box there in GoToWebinar, we will address them at the end of the presentation. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Al to get us started. All right, thank you, Marissa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, so real quick, I'd like to just go over what we're gonna cover. Uh, first, we're gonna go over the regulatory requirements um, as part of the mega rule, um, the due dates, what's required. Uh, we're gonna review the definitions of an MCA, data requirements for MCAs, um, including practical considerations for uh, conditioning the data. And then we're going to review uh, some software solutions for HCA MCA determination. So it's July 1st, 2021. Uh, what's due, right? So the procedures for MAOP reconfirmation, procedures for MAOP reconfirmation uh, were due as of today. So operators are required to have in place procedures to uh, conduct any MAOP reconfirmation efforts that they want to undertake. I apologize. I don't know why this is happening right now. I'm having some technical issues here. Um, these procedures should cover uh, any efforts that an operator want to, wants to undertake for MAOP reconfirmation. Uh, performing a spike test or material verification uh, as part of that MAOP reconfirmation uh, in accordance with the required uh, regulations. Um, PIMS also provided for a schedule for update of uh, or completion of the MAOP reconfirmation, 50% uh, of the pipeline mileage by July 3rd, 2028, and 100% of the mileage by July 2nd of 2035 or as soon as practicable. Um, PIMS also provided a um, exception there, uh, not to exceed four years after a pipeline segment uh, has been identified as being required to be uh, reconfirmed for their MAOP. Uh, additionally, uh, July 1st is also the deadline for operators to determine if they have any MCAs in their system. Uh, they need to develop a procedure to identify uh, what 
an MCA is on their on their pipeline system and then incorporate that procedure into their manual for uh, O&M as well as integrity management and then make sure that these procedures are have begun to be implemented. Uh, additionally, operators should be reporting MCAs as of uh, the March 15, 2022 deadline for annual reporting. Uh, and then finally, July 3rd, 2034, um, there's a deadline for expanded HCA assessment of gas transmission uh, lines. Any initial assessment should be performed on a risk-based prioritization schedule, and uh, all applicable segments should be initially assessed by July 3rd, 2034. Um, you can use a prior assessment if it was completed before July 1st of 2020. Uh, however, if you do use that assessment, you need to utilize the reassessment schedule based on the date of the assessment, not the current dates. So operators would have to backdate any reassessment intervals based on when the initial assessment was completed if they're using one prior to July 1st. Uh, so again, just to review the MAOP reconfirmation requirements, uh, FIMSA provided two requirements that um, operators need to review if um, to determine if they have to perform any MAOP reconfirmation efforts. Uh, the first criteria is that if an operator has no available records that are considered to be traceable, verifiable, and complete uh, to support an MAOP reconfirmation in accordance with uh, 192.619A2, which is a pressure test, um, including records uh, required by 192.517. So essentially, if you've performed a pressure test, but you don't have the material records to substantiate the design pressure, the MAOP pressure that that test was executed to, um, and it's located either in an HCA or a class three or four location. So those two criteria combined would require an operator to perform an MAOP reconfirmation effort. Uh, the second criteria is if you if an operator established their MAOP uh, in accordance with 192.619C, which is a historical record, uh, if you've used the last five years of pressure data to determine your MAOP, um, you have a 30% or greater SMICE, and you're located in an HCA, a class three or four location, and this is where the MCA definition comes in. Uh, an MCA, if the pipeline is available to be inspected by an ILI tool. And so if the operator meets one of those two criteria, they're required to um, reconfirm the MAOP of their, of their assets. So again, just to review the key dates, uh, today is July 1st. Operators that have identified uh, that they have MAOP reconfirmation efforts, efforts that have to be um, conducted should have procedures developed, documented, and in place by today, uh, July 1st, 2021. Um, regardless of the drop dead date, uh, if you've conducted any MAOP reconfirmation efforts, uh, your procedures had to have been completed before you started the MAOP reconfirmation efforts. Uh, if you're continuing to, to do the MAOP reconfirmation, um, your procedures have to be in place. And then just to reiterate again, 50% uh, of, of applicable mileage must be completed by 2028, July 2028, and then 100% of mileage must be completed by July 2nd of 2035 or as soon as practical. So again, just to uh, review how an operator can conduct an MAOP reconfirmation effort. FIMSA provided uh, six different methods, well, five methods plus an alternate method. Um, method one being just a regular pressure test in accordance with subpart J. Uh, method two is a pressure reduction based on the class location. Method, method three is an engineering critical analysis, which is documented in 192.632. So any operator that wants to conduct uh, an ECA should look at 192.632 and 192.710 to determine um, what requirements need to go into an ECA procedure and, and how to properly conduct an ECA. Uh, method four is, I say it's simple, it's not as simple as it sounds, but a pipe replacement. If the operator is planning on putting new pipe in the ground, you're gonna perform a pressure test that basically reconfirms the MAOP of that segment. Um, you're gonna have your material, as long as you're collecting your material records in accordance with 192.607, you can document that. Uh, the pipe replacement will basically take the place of an MAOP reconfirmation. Um, method five is a modification of method two, which is a pressure reduction if you have a low pressure pipeline with an impact radius of less than 150 feet. Uh, there's some additional patrolling requirements there, um, 
but again, it, it really determines on your, it's determined by your asset and what pressure you're operating at. And then uh, as PHMSA likes to do, uh, they provide method six for if you've thought of something better than what we've provided, you're allowed to uh, pitch it to us and see if we're okay with it. Um, and again, method six also comes with uh, some requirements that if you've submitted a request to PHMSA and they've not responded within 90 days, and that's considered to be an acceptance of the technology. So um, it's, it's critical that operators, uh, no matter what methodology you're using, you've got clearly defined documented procedures on how to perform um, any one of these methodologies for conducting your uh, MAOP reconfirmation. And all of these should be conducted in accordance in conjunction with any efforts to confirm your materials as part of a 192.607 project for materials verification. Uh, that's the key, the key issue here is making sure you know what's in the ground. And so with that, uh, toss it over and we'll discuss MCAs and how to implement MCAs into your uh, uh, HA analysis. Thanks, Al. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, MCA definition, uh, as Al indicated, is uh, 192.903. Uh, it's containing either five or more buildings intended for uh, human occupancy uh, and the addition of any portion of a paved surface, including shoulders of a designated interstate, a freeway, expressway, as well as principal arterial roadways with four or more lanes. Uh, the uh, minor consequence area extends actually along the pipelines from the outermost in, uh, edge of the first impact circle containing five or more or buildings or the paved surfaces. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So how do we implement NCAs into a gas HCA analysis? What are the data requirements? Identifying data sources for those requirements. Do the data sets contain the necessary attributes to support MCA analysis? And are there any data inconsistencies from state to state in the data set that you're going to be using? So the data requirements on the road data sets. So you are required to identify principal arterial uh, roadways, which include interstate freeways, expressways, uh, these are also designed to connect major cities, and these are the major thoroughfares that crisscross the United States and uh, the state that you're identified that you're working in. Uh, urban arterial roads are serve high volume corridors, bringing folks from uh, outer suburbia into major metropolitan areas uh, in the surrounding areas. And then you have rural arterial roads, which are carried uh, connecting your urbanized areas uh, into um, the principal uh, arterial in cities. So data sources, where to get the data? Uh, there are a number of different data sources that are available to uh, operators now. We have the Federal Highway Administration data sets, right, would have, which uh, are stewards and construction over all the national highways and bridges and tunnels. We have state departments of transportation or DOTs, individual states, you know, maintain and use their own data sets in instances where they do that throughout their, their own uh, constructions. And then you have the USGS national data sets, which is based off the Tiger Line and data sets. So the key is, is that not a single data source could be your solution. You have to be able to look at a number of different criteria uh, that are available and determine which is the best set for you to use. So do the data sets contain the needed attributes? As we indicated, uh, they're, you're looking for arterial roads that have four or more lanes uh, available with this one. Most public and commercial data sets, center lines are maintained as poly lines. Poly lines would need to be converted over to polygons because of the instance that you're needing to take in consideration uh, shoulder to shoulder width medians that are in those as well. So uh, some of the uh, national DOT uh, data sets are individual lines. So you'll have to 
take into consideration the work that you've had to do to be able to convert those into polygons and ensure that they have the required attributes that are looking for. Uh, DOT, the state of Texas is a good example of where they actually go above and beyond uh, the requirements, as you'll see here on the example. You have a right of way minimum covering the entire road and data set. They'll also indicate the width of the shoulder. They'll indicate the width of the lane travel and the direction. And they'll also provide you with the median, should there be a um, that, you know, medium between the two lane sets. So it's a very good example of the use of. With that being said, there are still some instances within the Texas DOT that still you have to go back and verify and, you know, manipulate that data because it's inconsistent. You'll have a road that says it's an MCA or a four lane requirement, but yet they'll have segments where the missing data that you'll actually have to go back and connect that data together. So it's very important that you do your due diligence with your data review. So data inconsistencies. Since each state is responsible for maintaining their own road data set, uh, you know, the data requirements and the data attributes that they feel are important for their, their particular state are inconsistent from state to state. No two states are, usually will have the same attributes if they're maintaining their data sets uh, um, in lieu of the tiger data from the, uh, the federal government. Uh, there are some states that use that tiger data. So with that being said, you know, your uh, state to state regulations are usually fairly consistent. They may modify it slightly, but it uh, it was fairly consistent, but states that carry their own, you know, you're going to have to make sure you do your due diligence about it and make sure those are maintained, knowing whether those are polylines versus polygons is extremely important because part of this process is if it's a polyline, you're going to need to create a polygon to be able to do your intersects with. So MCA data road data set implementation. So and try to get this into your system now. A large question is, is do you have pipelines running across the, the entire United States or are you localized into a single state? As we just indicated, if you're within a, a single state, you have a very good advantage to the fact that you're, used, you're dealing with a single data set that for you to manage to be able to QC and to be able to use within your uh, MCA designations. If you are instances where a lot of uh, operators, you're across multiple states uh, within the United States, you're going to have, uh, you know, your work cut out for you of being able to identify the correct data set you're going to be using from state to state, and then know the inconsistencies or, or missing data that you're going to have to manage going forward with your MCA designation. Get data sets, as we talked about, the yeah, DOT provides proper road width, the outside shoulder to outside, uh, outside shoulder. You now it's important, you know, that you create the buffers and polygons. They'll have a uh, flow direction on traffic. A lot of times you'll have a single poly line down the center of the road for both lanes traveling, you know, northbound, southbound, or east, west, whatever the case may be. So you actually need to be able to, you know, convert that single polygon, I mean, single polyline into a polygon designated for both travel uh, directions in your road data sets. Um, and the outside shoulder is very important, and inside shoulders are very important attributes that you must take into consideration while creating those polygons for your road data set. This is an instance of two different uh, road data sets that are available, two different states. The, the left instance, you'll see the New Jersey DOT. Uh, the blue lines are the center lines and the PIRs that are going along with that one, and the road sets are all in green in this particular instance. You're using the exact same data set, but you're using the USGS for New Jersey. If you look at the two, the center line and everything looks pretty straight up and the road data sets, you know, look comparable to each other. But when you overlay them, you get another view of what actually happens within that. 
So you'll notice that, you know, the, the, um, the difference in between the two, the DOT is the grain data set, the USGS is in red. So you'll see some instances where the DOT is lacking road intersections that could be comparable that you would need for your intersection. If you'll notice the pipeline corridor and the bottom half of the screen here has red lines that the DOT state jurisdiction did not incorporate. So it may be that you have to combine data sets to be effective for your MCA designation. The other problem that you come into is missing data, you know, and how to handle that. There are instances where you're going to have road data sets for a state that has missing data that you're going to have to um, make determinations and be able to set standards for how you're going to handle them. And the instance that, you know, G2 handles these, if you're missing a principal arterial road, we give it a 90 foot PIR distance for your buffer analysis. Your urban roads, we will set as a 70 foot uh, road PIR, and a rural will set as a 50 as a standard so that your consistency across all uses that you're having to make polygons for missing data within that data set. The other thing that you come into is that as you're using data sets, you'll find out that the same road could have different naming conventions, which will cause you problems when identifying MCA intersections. As you'll see in the instance here, your uh, lower uh, indication on this is the Yankee Expressway. The yellow in the middle is the US Highway 282. And then the top piece of this is actually US Highway 7. So, and it's all the same road, but it's actually Interstate 84 at the same time. So you have to be able to identify those inconsistencies, determine which name that you're going to be able to use so that it doesn't impact your uh, multiple intersections for different road sets that you're going across. Data set standard collections. As we have said, you establish road data sets and identify any missing gaps in your uh, attributes that are required. Establish and normalize road types across states, you know, set standards, you know, to cover all uh, various state issues that are going to be identified. And then there might be some individual anomalies that pop up as you go through the individual states and do your uh, your. QC and data analysis that you may have to do some manual tweaking to be able to uh, get the compliance that you'll need for NCA designation. You have to know the road surface details for you know normalizing roads. Set roads from DOTs may not cover all the surfaces, right? As we indicated, that your center line may be in the middle of the road instead of being on you know both directions of the road and knowing the width that you have to be able to take that into consideration. And then est establishing and normalizing road names as you move forward. So in conclusion, you know, data selection methods, you know, selecting the correct data set may you know, be a factor outcome, knowing that DOTs have inconsistencies from what USGS has in the Federal Highway instructions. So the pros of that are all the data is from the USGS, all data is available from one location. All road data sets have the exact same format across different states. And then the individual DOTs you know, are directly affected in some cases by USGS or Tiger data. So remember, it, you know, it take, may take multiple data sets to cover. So with so that, I'll turn it over to Trace. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about software. And this is a view of what uh, what our software looks like. And it uh, looks like we're getting a little bit of uh, feedback. So Terry or Alex, I don't mind the mics for the moment. Thanks, guys. So what we're looking at here is the is the way our HCA analysis software presents inside of the G2 software. 
And the software runs in either ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro. Most of the software that uh, that G2 creates is actually created as an extension to um, the Esri GIS suite since what runs on top of it. And what you're seeing here in the uh, right-hand side of the slide is, is basically a configured version of our base HCA MCA analysis tool. And uh, the thing to understand about the software is that it is highly configurable. And the reason that we make it highly configurable is that different people use different data models and have different implementations of their database, sometimes different workflows um, that need to be supported. And so we've tried to make the software very, very flexible. Um, but what you can see in this example here is that, is that basically we need a few key things. Uh, we need to have uh, input pipeline centerline features. Uh, in a pods relational database, that would be that would be your route features. Uh, in a pod seven database, that would be your continuous network features. In this example, it's an APDM database, and so we're asking for station series features. We also need to have your uh, your input structures, and uh, those can be either in the form of polygon footprints, as they are in this example, or as points, or as a combination of the two. And of course. We need your identified sites uh, delineated separately from your structures so that uh, so that we can do HCA determination based on identified sites. Now, we also need some information to calculate the potential impact radius or PIR. And, uh, and so we give you uh, input parameters to collect that data. In this case, we're getting uh, diameter information, nominal diameter information from our pipe segment layer and we're getting MAOP information from our operating pressure. And that allows us to calculate um, the PIR. We also allow you to go ahead and uh, change the PIR factor if you need to do so. So it defaults to 0 0.69, which is uh, the default for, for dry gas. You can put 0.73 in there if you are, are running a wet gas system, or if you're running some other kind of flammable gas that you would like to do this type of analysis for, um, you can go ahead and insert an entirely different PIR factor. Now, we also need road data sets for the calculation of MCAs. And uh, in this example here, we're using the TxDOT roadway inventory data set. And, uh, and we allow you to pick one or more fields out of those data sets to define the actual roadway width so that we can convert the polylines to polygons. Uh, in the text.data data set, there's two attributes that we're concerned with, the uh, roadbed width attribute, which you see highlighted here, and then also the, uh, the median width attribute, right? And we output all of this stuff to a, uh, to a file geo database um, so that you have a permanent archive of everything that went into the analysis as well as the results of the analysis. And of course, you can push that back into your enterprise GIS um, if you have one of those. Uh, go ahead, give me the next slide, please, Al. So the tools are actually distributed as a Python module. I'm going to get a little techy here for a moment. And as a collection of uh, two different uh, geoprocessing toolboxes inside of either the ArcGIS Pro um, or ArcMap desktop environment. Um, the first set of tools that you see here on the, uh, on the left are a collection of low-level tools. And the configurable high-level end-user tools that you'll actually use are built on top of these things. And I'm showing them here just to let you know that, that, um, that you've got a very rich tool set from which you can craft your own workflows if you don't happen to like um, the workflows that we've presented as our, as our master tools, which are the tool sets that you see on the right. And what you'll see there is that we provide tools for um, doing uh, what we call standard analysis for either class location determination or HCA MCA determination. And understand our HCA MCA tool, it does both at the same time. So your HCAs are identified at the same time as your, uh, as your MCAs. Uh, we have time aware versions of those tools. So if you are uh, running a database that has your existing HCA, MCA, or class location results, you can pull those into the, uh, as an input parameter into the analysis, and then we segment that information into the output results. And so what it gives you is a very clear indication of where things are changing and, uh, and lets you know where HCAs or MCAs are expanding or where class location boundaries are changing. Uh, you'll also notice uh, there's a tool set in there to handle regulated gathering determination. Uh, so the tool set also, also supports that. 
And again, I want to emphasize that these tools are very highly configurable. Uh, those guys over there on the right, uh, for those of you who might recognize the icon type, those are actually model builder model tools, and they're exposed in Esri's visual programming environment so that you can kind of just connect the dots in terms of, uh, in terms of altering workflows. Uh, next slide, please, Al. So let's take a look at some examples of, of MCAs. And this first example that we're going to look at is an example uh, from our, our KDE pipeline system. It's a pipeline system that we use for training. And what we're looking at here are just the HCAs. And, uh, and so you'll see the HCAs as red highlighted zones along the pipeline center line, which is shown in black. And this KD transmission line, what you'll notice here is that it's running parallel uh, to Interstate 10 uh, here on the west side of Houston, actually. And, uh, and as you might expect, Al, if you could advance next for me, please. Um, because we're running parallel to the road, pretty much this whole entire line segment uh, that's running here parallel to I-10 is going to light up as a uh, as an MCA and the reason for that is is that I can falls entirely within the PIR of this pipeline right and uh, one more please Al and if we zoom in a little bit here um, what you'll see is what's going on exactly you can see kind of in this kind of pink salmon color uh, the PIR of the pipeline and then just to the south of the KD transmission line you see the simple polyline representation of I-10. And then in that heavy darker color gray, uh, you see the polygon version of, uh, of I-10 created from the width attribution that we have in the text.data set. And of course, it's entirely uh, inside of the PIR. And this is a, a, a type of thing that we're seeing fairly commonly um, in uh, the different operators that we work with in their data. And it's not surprising, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases, your pipelines uh, co-inhabit right of ways that include roads or railroads or power lines or, or what have you. And in the case where, uh, where you've got that, that uh, you're, you're sharing the right of way with a qualifying MCA road, you're pretty much gonna light up the whole thing as MCA. And, uh, and so this is a pretty common one that we see. All right, let's take a look at a second example. So Al, next slide, please. So this is an example of what we would call sort of a, a, a classic MCA caused purely by um, buildings intended for human occupancy. Um, so if you recall, your, your threshold for HCAs is 20 or more structures inside of, the, uh, inside of the PIR. And as Terry covered for an MCA, if I have between five and 19 uh, buildings intended for human occupancy or BIOS as we call them, uh, inside the PIR, then that's going to cause an MCA. And we're zoomed in to a finer level of detail here on our KD transmission line. And so we're looking at more finely segmented results. And in this case, these segments carry the structure count or BIHO count for each segment. And that's labeled, uh, those numbers labeled on top of the center line there is that, that's, that, that running house count, if you will. And what you'll see is that we run from the Northeast to the Southeast. Um, we enter into a portion where we uh, where we cross that threshold um, to five structures, and as we keep working our way uh, to the southwest, we get up as high as 12, and then we drop back down below that threshold of five again, and we're out of that area where the PIR is directly touching uh, touching structures. Um, but as you recall, and again, as uh, as Terry went over, we also have to extend the MCA in either direction along the center line. Um, by the length of the PIR from the last structure that the uh, that the um, range covers or that the PIR touches, and so that's what you see there in those lighter extensions in yellow. So this is uh, this is something that we see quite often. You know, just basically um, we get to a situation where we've got some increasing um, structural density and we have what we would call a, a naked MCA. Now, Al, if you'll take us to the next slide, we'll look at our final example here. And this is an example of an MCA that's caused by a combination of roads and structures. And so if, uh, if you look at this guy again, coming in from the Northwest, we cross that threshold where we get up to uh, five structures and we're into what we would call the direct portion of the MCA. 
<coughs> excuse me. And then as we work our way to the southwest, what you'll notice is that we drop below five structures, but we're still in uh, direct MCA territory. And the reason for that is you can see a line crossing or road um, crossing the pipeline running from uh, southeast to northwest. Uh, you can see the dark gray poly line that represents um, that road as it comes to us from TxDOT. And then the heavier gray, um, that is the polygon representation of the road based on road width. And then in that lightly gray stippled um, pattern, what you see is the PIR buffer on the road. And, and so anywhere where we're crossing the center line with that guy, that, uh, that, that road is within the PIR of the, uh, of the pipeline or the pipeline PR can affect the road. And so we've got a situation down there at the south, um, southwestern corner where the MCA is caused purely by the presence of the road. And in fact, when you get out into the extension, there are no structures at all. Um, so so the, uh, the MCA at the southwestern end is caused entirely um, by the presence of the road, not by structures, right? So those are some examples of some pretty common scenarios that we run into as we do this type of analysis. Um, another example, which I didn't create a slide for, is that we often see HCA ranges surrounded by fringe of MCA. Right, and that just reflects, you know, gradually increasing structure density as we get into an MCA. In many cases, you'll see a, a, a rind of, of MCA around the overall HCA. Now, this is just a very brief taste of, uh, of what the software does. Um, some of you may have atten attended a, uh, a presentation that we did a little over a year ago that went into the software in much more detail. So you can look that up if you'd like to learn more or just give us a call. Um, so let's go ahead and advance to the uh, to the next slide, and uh, let's go ahead and and kind of wrap it up here. And what I want to do is just go over the the main messages that uh, that Al and Terry and and I have have presented to you. Um, so first, regulatory deadlines. So you know today today is a big day uh, for everybody, right? And essentially, you you really need to have your reconfirmation procedures for MAOP in place today and incorporated into your, into your manuals. And as a reminder of, uh, of, of, uh, of the schedule, you basically you need to have 50% of your pipeline mileage done by 2028, uh, this time of year, <clears throat> and then 100% by 2035. Um, but bear in mind the, uh, the, the caveat that, uh, that Al gave you, you know, if you uh, meet the conditions of 192.624a, basically you have four years. Right, so it's uh, it's um, in some cases you're going to be required to get ahead of that that overall schedule. Um, as of today, your MCAs must be determined, right? And uh, and as an adjunct to that, you need to have your your procedures for your MCAs incorporated into your documentation. Um, so so today is is kind of a big day. Um, and in terms of how that affects your assessments. Um, your initial assessments of these areas outside of HCAs, these moderate consequence areas, um, just as we did back in the day for the implementation of, uh, of the original integrity rule um, for HCAs, you should be using a risk-based prioritization schedule for all of that. And the idea here is that you're to have all of your assessments complete no later than uh, 1st of July or July 3rd, 2034. Um, but the, the caveat there is really as soon as practicable, right? So the idea is, hey, if you can you can do it, you need to you need to get that assessment done. And then last but not least, and this is this is the the modifier to that, um, you've got a, a maximum of ten years from the point that your MCA um, segment first meets the condition of 192.710, which is basically is the thing piggable. All right, so if it's a pickable segment, really you've only got 10 years. You don't have that that full 14 years. Right now, um, the biggest challenge to doing moderate consequence area analysis, as Terry went into in in some detail, is is that the the road data is a big challenge. Right, uh, you saw that the data sets vary from state to states. In some cases, you'll have multiple data sets within a state, and they don't agree with each other. A lot of times you're missing the necessary data attribution. You don't have attribution that's going to give you a road width, so you have to come up with some kind of standard, as uh, as Terry uh, showed. Um, so, so 
you know, you've got you've got data issues as well. And then finally, what you'll find in a lot of cases, and we, we I should have pointed it out in that little text dot example, um, the attribution that you have it might not be right, or it might be internally inconsistent. And uh, you'll see segments of road that are are classified as something that qualifies as an MCA road, and then an immediately adjacent segment that doesn't get that same classification and yet you go and you look at the aerial imagery and it looks like it ought to be the same thing right so so there's actually a lot of work to be done conditioning road data and it really shouldn't surprise anybody because it's really never been used for this type of purpose before and uh, tell your folks here at t2 they can he can help you out if you're if you're running in problems with that uh, we're doing an awful lot of that work and then lastly our software tools are available commercially available for use in doing these determinations they've actually been available for a little over a year now and uh, and yeah you can do this stuff by hand but it's a lot easier to have some good software to do it and uh, we can we can certainly help in, in that department and so with that uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up and we're happy to entertain any questions Okay, it looks like we have a couple questions here. Let's see. Okay, it says, how often do you find differences in the road data from state to state? Terry, you want to answer? Sure. That? Yeah, you're oh, muted, buddy. <laughs> right, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take it. So thank you, Marissa. Uh, absolutely, as we indicated earlier, if the state is using the Tiger data for their uh, the road systems, it's fairly consistent with the, the federal uh, standards that they, they indicate. But it's when you have individual states that are creating their own polylines uh, for a road data sets, the attribution becomes inconsistent then from state to state. And it's, uh, as Tracy indicated, it's a lot of due diligence that you have to do to make sure it's consistent. Okay. Um, does the GAS HCA tool software support Esri's ArcGIS pipeline referencing? Uh, yes, it does. So we actually we actually built it with that in mind, and uh, and really, you know, I showed the software in ArcGIS Pro, and it, that's really its primary home. Uh, we still can continue to support running an ArcMap, um, but you actually have to have Pro installed on the machine, and uh, and so even though it will run in ArcMap, it's it's really aimed at ArcGIS Pro and the latest versions of Azure technology and, and the latest data models. So, so yes. Okay. Says we conduct a risk assessment for facility sites located within HCAs. Should we be doing the same for facility sites in MCAs? Al, I think that's one for you. So it's, Rules aren't inherently clear about the facility side. Um, you know, if it's if it's part of a, a facility integrity management program, then I, I would recommend you do. Um, however, the, the the regulations right now are strictly for pipeline assets, not facility assets. Um, there may be some clarification in that in the future, but uh, again, as of right now, it's it's really dependent upon what you're trying to accomplish with your program. Says what length of pipe is classified to be MCA on either side of a qualifying road crossing? So, so it it depends on the PIR, right? And it's it's basically whatever whatever wherever your PIR can touch the paved portion of that road, including the shoulders, then that's that's the direct portion of your MCA. And then you extend actually along the pipeline center line away from that point where the PIR first touches the road, right? And that, that defines the beginning of your of your MCA. And then similarly, as you as you are leaving the road, the last point at which your at which your PIR touches that road, and then actually extending along the pipeline by the length of the PIR, that defines the other end of it. Okay. So Road, road MCAs work very much like like structure MCAs, it, but you only need you only need one road, right? I don't need to have more than one road inside the PIR. It looks like that 
is the last of the questions. So that's all we have for today. Thank you for joining the presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll be sending out a copy of today's presentation as long as a, uh, as well as a link to the recording after this. So be on the lookout for that. Um, have a wonderful and safe 4th of July weekend and thanks for joining. We'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Thanks, bye. Thank you.